Welcome to lecture 28 on sample and model complexity. So today we are going to look at the second half of the story on VC dimension. We want to use the VC dimension we learned from the last lecture to help us understand the generalization bound furthermore. And then we want to introduce the notion of sample complexity and model complexity. And furthermore, we want to talk about the trade-off between these two complexities. So to start with, I want to remind everyone what do we mean by VC dimension. A VC dimension is a measure of how complex or how expressive is your hypothesis set. And this VC dimension is a function depending on the, the hypothesis set H. Now, the VC dimension is denoted as VD or VC. It is the largest number of training samples for which your hypothesis sets can ever shatter. So here, the, the, the number of training samples is n, and, but when you calculate the VC dimension, the VC dimension is independent of the number of uh, training samples. You are calculating the maximum number of training samples that your hypothesis sets H can ever shatter. And therefore, the VC dimension is really a metric of the hypothesis sets of how e expressiveness is your hypothesis sets. It has nothing to do with your learning algorithm. It has nothing to do with your probability distribution. It's just depending on the hypothesis sets. If you have a more complex set, then VC dimension will be higher. If you have less complex sets, the VC dimension will be smaller. VC dimension would be a very good number for you to quantify the complexity of a model. And we should expect to see that if you have a more complex model, VC, VC dimension grows, then the generalization bound will become a little bit more uh, trickier because the, as, the, as the model becomes complex, then probably you need to have more samples to overcome the, com the complication in your, in your model. Now, what do we mean by shatter? The concept of shatter in this e equation is that the, is the, is the maximum number of, uh, of, of training samples that can ever be reached using the dichotomies. So suppose I have n training data points, we ask what is the maximum number of configurations that you will ever be able to have, that would be 2 to the power n. And then we ask, what is the number of dichotomies? Now remember that the dichotomy it really depends on the configurations of your data points. So you can move the data points around and find the maximum number of dichotomies. If the maximum number of dichotomies can ever reach 2 to the power n, okay, then we say that the, the hypothesis can actually shatter n data points. It could be two data points, it could be three data points. For example, if you're working in a 2D space, you're using a linear classifier, then we have shown that the, the number of data points that can be shattered would be three. Okay? And therefore we say that the VC dimension of a linear classifier in two dimensional space would be v, uh, D of VC equals to three. So uh, this is the definition of VC dimension, and we have gone through all these discussions before. If you give me a hypothesis set H, uh, for example, a linear model, uh, you tell me the number of training samples is n, and then uh, you start with a small n, and then you start to grow this n as n becomes a bigger and bigger, and eventually you will hit a bump that you will not be able to shatter. And for example, in 2D, n is 3, that would be okay, but when n goes to 4, that would become not okay. So I have found the largest n such that my, my, my hypothesis set can shatter the training samples. Uh, for example, in 2D, the VC dimension is 3, as I have described. If H is more complex, then you need a more a larger VC dimension. And it does not depend on the distribution learning algorithm and also the target function. That is the power of the VC dimension, which makes it very, very universal for all kinds of learning algorithms, uh, including SVM, support vector machines, uh, the neural networks, and also the perceptron algorithm, and also the logistic regression, and so on. So now, in, in today's lecture, we want to try to link the VC dimension to the growth function. And by doing this, we will be also able to try to put this notion of the VC dimension into uh, our generalization bound, and then we can draw some interpretations from that. So to start with, I want to point you to this theorem. It's called the Sauer Lemma. The Sauer Lemma it says that the growth function, this n, uh, the m, mh of n, is 
the upper bound by the summation of this uh, a combinatorial uh, 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 sums. Okay, so you have n and choose i, and then you're summing the i's from zero to vc dimension uh, uh, to the vc dimension. Now, the proof of this result I'm skipping here, which you can find in the textbook called uh, Learning from Data, that is in chapter 2.2. .2. So you can find the proof over there. But uh, what I want to do here is try to draw the connection from, as you can see that here you have the growth function, and then on the, on the, on the right hand side, you have this uh, equation. The interesting thing about this equation on the right hand side is that although it looks complicated, uh, that has to be a polynomial in terms of the, the, D, the, the VC dimension. So what you can show is the following. You can show that the, uh, the summation of the, the combinatorial sum is upper bounded by n to the power uh, d of vc. Okay, so what you, why, how can we prove that? Well, you can prove by your very simple mathematical induction, and you can do it as your own exercise. Now, with this equation, what you can do is that then you can show that the growth function, okay, mh of n, it would be a what? It would be upper bounded by n to the power of d of vc plus 1. Okay, so now you can find the upper bound on the growth function, and that growth function applies to all kinds of, um, uh, uh, all kinds of learning algorithms, and it's a function on the n. So now let's use this result and try to plug in into our uh, generalization bound and see if we can draw something meaningful. So before we do that, let's also take a quick look at the meaning of the, uh, the difference between the VC dimension and also the Hafting inequality. Uh, so here we are showing you the three diagrams. If you're only looking at one uh, Hafting inequality, then you're only looking at one set of data points. But if you're using a union bound, then you're assuming all these data points, they are, uh, they, they, they're located in this way. Uh, it's not the data point, it's the, actually the hypothesis set. Now, if you look at the, the VC bound, then the VC bound says that all these hypotheses, they are, they overlapping. So that is the difference. And that's why if you can show the, the growth number, and if you can draw the upper bound on the growth number, then hopefully we can reach not the union bound, but the VC bound as what I'm going to show you next. Okay. So remember that this is the generalization bound, which we have discussed before. In the middle of this equation, you have, you have uh, EE of G, okay, so the E out of G, this is your testing error. You want to put the sandwich inequality on the two sides, as what I'm showing you here. On the left hand side, you have the, e, is the, the training error, and then on the right hand side, you also have a training error, one is minus some terms, one is plus some terms. Now, in this set of equations, you can see that there is a factor of M. M is the number of hypotheses that you can find in your hypothesis set. And as we have discussed before, this M can grow to infinity, and this is going to kill the generalization bar and make it useless. So what we can do here is that we can replace the M by the growth function MH of M. So if you replace that, then let's look at the, uh, the, the right hand side, let's look at the upper bound. Then you can replace the, uh, the capital M in this equation by the small m. And furthermore, we understand that the small m is, uh, is upper bound by n to the power d of vc plus 1, which we just showed using the, the, using the sour lemma. Then we can replace the m in that equation by the equation that I have down here. So what you can see is that instead of having a big M, I have N to the power D of VC plus 1. So you ask, wow, well, you're making, you're replacing an M, which is a constant, by N to the power D of VC. Uh, that seems to be even more complicated. But if you take a closer look at this equation, you realize that this N to the power DC, uh, D of VC, that is a much smaller number than M. What is M? And is M is the number of hypotheses that you can find in your hypothesis set. And by construction, this number can go to infinity. What is N to the power D? N to the power D is just the number of training samples to the power of the 
the, the VC dimension of your, of, of your hypothesis set. Now we understand that for different hypothesis sets, you have different expressiveness. For example, if you're looking at a linear classifier, the, the VC dimension of a linear classifier in 2D space is just a 3. And so n to the power 3, how big can that number be compared to an infinitely large m? Even if you choose a, a deep neural network, if you choose, choose a perceptron algorithm, not a deep neural network, perceptron algorithm, this d of vc, that number is just d plus 1. And we understand that by taking n to the power d plus 1, that is still a polynomial uh, in terms of n. And therefore, compared to the infinitely large m, uh, this n to the power d would be a significantly smaller number. And in addition, uh, you realize that there is a log in front of this uh, n to the power d. This log is actually further making the, the influence of the VC dimension smaller. And therefore, you can see that the, the generalization bar becomes significantly more tighter than before. Before you have, if you want to consider all these possible hypotheses in your hypothesis set, this n would be a big number, but now you have a much, much, much smaller of n to the power d, and that makes your, your upper bound much tighter, so is your, uh, your, your lower bound. So this is wonderful, and everything is characterized by the quantity delta, which is your confidence level. You tell me how much confidence you want to be, and then I can tell you what is the minimum number of training samples you need, given the hypothesis set that I have in hand. So VC dimension tells us the expressiveness of our model, and come, when, when we look at this equation, we should be able to, to, to tell what is the number of training samples required to achieve the confidence level that I want. So let's look at the generalization bound again. Uh, if the VC dimension is less than infinity, then as n goes to infinity, this is the accuracy, okay, so the accuracy is defined as the square root of all these uh, 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 1 over 2n times the log of your, your, your VC dimension and so on. So as n goes to infinity, you can see that this quantity is going to zero. Now why is this true? Well, you have two factors of n, one is inside the log, the other one is in the denominator. So as n goes to infinity, log of n to the power d, that will grow a lot slower than the n in the denominator. And therefore, as n goes to infinity, the denominator will, will, will dominate, and therefore, this epsilon will go to zero as n goes to infinity. So if this is the case, then the high final hypothesis she will be able to generalize. Why? Because if you recall from the previous slide, that the generalization bound says that my testing error would be up about my, my testing error, by my, by my training error, plus uh, this, this accuracy level. So as n goes to infinity, meaning that I have more and more training samples, first of all, my training error will approach to my testing error, that is given. And the two is that my accuracy will also go to a, a very, very small number, eventually go to zero. Now, the other case is that when, when, when VC dimension is infinity, then what will happen? Well, then, then your hypothesis says H is as diverse as it can ever be, uh, and so you will not be able to generalize. And so the message number one is that if you choose a very, very complex model, then you need to pay the price of training samples. Okay. In other words, if you have a really, really complex model, then this generalization part says that Yes, then you need to give me a lot of training samples in order to compensate for the complexity of your model. Message number two is that if you choose an extremely complex model, then you may not even be able to generalize regardless of the number of training samples. So uh, that tells you the two levels of messages. One is that uh, if your model is complex but not too complex, then the number of training samples will help. Message two is that if your model is too complex, then even if you have infinitely many uh, training samples, that will not be able to help you solve the generalization problem.
So let's summarize what we have discussed so far. Let's look, just look at the upper bound because the, 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 the lower bound can be, can be written in the same way. So this is what we call the generalization bound or using the VC dimension. Uh, here, uh, we are replacing all the quark constants by an A and 4 and 2N. This is just some technical uh, details that you can find in the textbook's appendix. So let's just put the, in the, the AM, uh, the growth function into this equation. And so um, I'm skipping the technical requirements here. And how tight can this uh, generalization be? Uh, this is, uh, this is not very tight, so we'll come back to this point later, okay? But if you look at this equation here, the, 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 uh, the testing error, this is uh, E out of your final hypothesis compared to your E in. On the right hand side, this accuracy, this is, and this is given by the growth function. And we know that the growth function can be further upper bound by n to the power of the VC dimension. And since you have 2n here, then just replace the, the, the quantity by 2, 2n to the power of the, the, the VC dimension plus 1. So then you can get a very useful generalization bound. Now, at this point, we can argue that this generalization bound is much, much better then what we have before using the, just the half the inequality. And you will feel, hope that, okay, by just calculating this generalization bound, I should be able to tell you a very, very good story about the, uh, about the generalization ability. Uh, the, the, the downside of this generalization bound is that although it is, it is much better than the half the inequality, um, but it's still not extremely tight. Uh, the, the, the couple of reasons that this uh, inequality is, is not that tight. First of all, the halving inequality has a slack. Uh, meaning that because when you calculate the halving inequality, you are using the Markov inequality, you're using these uh, moment generating functions, that actually introduce some kind of slack. Uh, that inequality is, is general, is too general for all values of E out. Now, remember that the Huffington inequality is an inequality that applies to all kinds of learning algorithms and applies to all kinds of hypotheses. And that kind of generality, this universality, just make it not possible to be too customized and to make it really, really tight for all problems. And so you have one level of slackness here. Uh, the other one of the slackness is that the growth function m here uh, is also just giving you the worst case scenario. Okay, and typically you may not, you may not require to reach all these, uh, n possible situations, the, the, the two to the power n, uh, situations. Okay, so, so now, uh, this mh, this growth function is giving you the worst case scenario. You may not be able to reach that. Typically you, the average performance could be a lot less than the worst case. And therefore this is, this upper bound becomes a, a more conservative way of estimating the error. Now, furthermore, um, the sour inequality that we, we were given in the lemma before, this will also introduce some kind of slackness, uh, because then we are, we are, we bonding the, the growth function using a polynomial, and that bond will also cause some issue in terms of bonding the, the generalization.